All right, I'll kick off my talk after this this session. We'll see how I do. Oh, immediately lose. Understand that at all. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, so this is WarriorWare DIY. Um, this is the, the sort of like the main focus uh, for this talk in the long run. Um, but uh, I am not going to dive into it quite yet. I think it's maybe good, good framing to know that that WarriorWare is like mini games like really short games that play in a matter of a few seconds um for context for where this talk is, is headed but we're actually not going to spend a lot of time on on uh on warrior diy directly um so okay so let's see the set context so um last castle halloween party uh i gave a, a talk that was a kind of a tour of warrior diy and i kind of went over all of the I poked around the game and tried a bunch of different screens and showed off a bunch of different UI details. Um, and I still want to do that. Um, but uh, what happened was I, I got a bunch of requests for a recording of that talk, but we had just messed up our recording and we didn't have like saved copies. Um, so uh, I wanted to do like a new, uh, basically an updated version of, of that talk where I kind of show off all the great design decisions, UI decisions that, that, that uh, WarioWare DIY has in it. Um, but when I sat down to kind of do the prep for this kind of uh, second round of, of, uh, of a walkthrough of, of WarioWare, um, I wanted to add a little bit of like extra history and context and answer some questions that I got that I didn't have answers to in the last talk. Uh, and also I just kind of poured over the game again and just tried to find whether any things that I missed that, that were cool. Um, and uh, and in that process, I basically uncovered both that there's a super rich history that's totally worth sharing, and that there are a bunch of little things that I missed in the actual game itself that are also worth sharing. So I ended up with basically like two out hour, two hours ish of like talk material, which seemed a little uh, ambitious for uh, for this stream. So uh, what I decided to do was was split this talk into into two parts. Um, and so part one is going to be the history and context talk. And then part two is going to be like the design and, uh, and UI talk where I kind of go over all the, all the details. So in this talk, it's actually going to be almost entirely about, uh, the history of everything that kind of like led up to Nintendo making WarioWare DIY. Um, and, and then the next talk will be actually like digging deep into WarioWare DIY. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this is, um, uh, uh, part of the castle spring party. So we're hanging out, um, in, mostly in the, the castle discord and, and making spring themed stuff and sharing it and having fun and hanging out. It's pretty casual, but, um, if you're, if you're not participating, uh, I would, I do invite you to, to join and hang out. Um, but I'm not gonna be talking about castle, uh, in this talk, uh, as much as, uh, uh Nintendo. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna do kind of like a history of Nintendo's various, uh, creative tools and authoring tools that uh, were sort of the predecessors to WarioWare DIY. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in this history, both just as like a particular history of WarioWare DIY, which is a game that I, that I love, um, but I also just am generally interested in whenever Nintendo bites off a, a creative tool or an authoring tool. Um, and there are a couple of reasons. I think like one reason is just that I grew up on Nintendo. Uh, Nintendo is, you know, has like a deep emotional resonance for me, and I know it does for a lot of people. Um, and so, just getting a deeper history on Nintendo is really interesting. Um, but in particular, I'm interested in this because uh, Nintendo, on the game side, uh, has a, a spectacular talent uh, for uh, how a game teaches players skills. So. Um, Nintendo games often have the quality that almost anyone can pick up the controller and get started and 
can understand like the most basic things to like move a character or to drive a car or whatever. Um, they have this uh, incredible achievement of like accessibility while also being very deliberate about the sort of uh, the sequencing and the learning process that players go through. Um, what do players learn? What do they already know coming into the game? What do we need to teach them? How do we teach them? In what order do we teach them? Um, is something that Nintendo is, is particularly uh, skilled at. Um, and you never really see that thought put into creative tools. I mean, some tools have a bit of a tutorial, um, but it's never as much care as goes into uh, a game um, and it's like a, a top tier Nintendo game. And so it's really interesting to see that sequential learning attitude applied to creative tools. Um, and then a second thing that I think is really key about Nintendo's approach to design is just their uh, commitment to craft and care and joy and packing every little screen and every little corner of the interface with something clever and surprising and fun and uh, uh, interesting. And so uh, that's, again, something that, you know, coming more from like a regular software design background, we, we don't do nearly as much. Um, when we talk about delight, we talk about like one or two details here and there, like, you know, a cool icon or a nice little animation or transition, but uh, nothing at the at the scale or scope of, of uh, the the stuff that Nintendo is willing to do. So uh, it's really interesting to see them also kind of get that labor of love and, and get all those little joyful details kind of like littered throughout. So um, it's a it's a really cool uh, uh, history of, of software that they've created um, that, that kind of reflects those those design talents. Um, I'm also interested in going over this because it shows how many trial and error like attempts Nintendo had at various things in this category. Um, not that WarioWare DIY is some uh, magnum opus of theirs, but uh, there is a lot of work that came before it. And when you're just looking at a, at a piece of, uh, of design work, you don't really get to see all the historical work that informed the development of that. And so it's really useful to see how much uh, something is designed in the context of a history, of a lineage, of a, of a culture, of people. And so you'll see a continuity of ideas that go from like the very first stuff into like the most recent stuff. You'll also see a continuity of people. You'll see a lot of missteps and mistakes. Um, and I think that that rich history is, is totally worth understanding as you um, try to appreciate um, something. So um, that's sort of my, my, my meta preamble. Let's just go ahead and, and start to dig into um, Nintendo's history of creative tools. Um, so uh, this is the, the earliest example. Uh, so this is the family basic. So if you grew up um, outside of Japan, like me, uh, you did not have a Famicom. Um, that's the Famicom right there. Uh, the Famicom was sort of upgraded and uh, released as the Nintendo Entertainment System um, in America. So I grew up with the NES. Um, but in Japan, if you had the Famicom, you could get this peripheral for it uh, with the keyboard, uh, and it was called Family Basic. Um, and so it was a uh, you know Nintendo's entry into the home computer market um, at a time where I think like computers and video game consoles didn't have as uh, stark a dividing line as they do today. Um, and you can see that there's that little uh, uh, screenshot uh, that I found in a YouTube video where uh, when you execute the code, you can get this like Mario sprite to kind of explode and, and cover the screen, um, which is which is pretty fun. And, um, you know, going back to that, 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 that aspect of Nintendo that I mentioned of that sensitivity to the sequential learning, it also included an extremely uh, detailed and robust uh, guide that taught basics. So you have like Mario um, sort of like teaching concepts of how to like program in basic. Um, there's gameplay examples, there's art examples, there's music examples. And so you get this like rich multimedia thing, um, which is really cool. Another aspect that I think is really uh, uh, worth looking at in a lot of these cases is how um, sharing and archiving uh, your content uh, was handled. So in this case, this was, um, you know, you would save your data on this, like these cassette tapes on the Nintendo data recorder, which has an incredibly cool looking uh, box um, with these cool Nintendo branded cassette tapes. And so uh, the, the stuff that you would create um, in, uh, in Family Basic, you would, you would save to this uh, cassette tape recorder. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's worth looking at this piece of, the, of these different tools because I think in a lot of cases you, you see Nintendo um, taking various stabs at archiving, sharing, presenting um, uh, the output of these kind of creative tools. So it's not, uh, it's not that this content is trapped inside of some closed ecosystem. These are things that are Nintendo's being considerate about how the content is going to be released and shared and distributed. Um, and they're sensitive to that, that component as well. And so I think it's cool to kind of see the various attempts at, at looking at that. Um, so, uh, so the basic, the family basic was not uh, uh, particularly successful. Um, you know, it was Japan only. 
um, and uh, the technology it used couldn't couldn't be ported to the the newer Nintendo system. So um, I don't know how consequential it was um, uh, in the in the broader scheme of things in the landscape of of uh, basic or or home computers. Um, but uh, you do see threads of a lot of their their philosophy here that will continue to carry through. Um, so the the next little little beat of history that I want to talk about. Um, so if we cut forward a few years, the Nintendo is an explosive success and um, uh, kids everywhere are going nuts for it and they're like playing it and they're addicted and there's this kind of like growing concern for uh, the dangers of video games, right? That like they'll rot uh, your children's minds um, and that it's like pure uh, uh, silliness and has no like substantive value. Um, this is this device that I found from this era, the homework first. Uh, which is like this like lock that you can like attach to the Nintendo with like a, a key uh, a password um, so that you can, as a parent, you can kind of uh, regulate your kid's screen time with, uh, with a padlock mechanism. Um, and so there was this kind of like wave of, of hype around Nintendo. And then there was this like wave of, of parental concern um, and politicians started to get involved and pressuring Nintendo to do something about this. Um, and so there's this one little, this little, uh, this is a, this is kind of a diversion or a digression from, um, uh, the the main theme, but it was there's so many little fun details about this historical moment that, that I wanted to uh, to pause and, and kind of dig into this. So, one of the things they did um, when they were responding to some of this controversy was in 1990, um, they donated three million dollars to uh, MIT Media Lab, um, Seymour Papert's group, and that's Seymour Papert right there. Um, and uh, it was three million dollars for um, pure epistemological research, which is just kind of a funny phrase to imagine Nintendo dropping three million dollars on epistemology. Um, and there's this great, uh, I found this great like Time Magazine uh, article uh, from this period that, that kind of talks about the announcement. And I, this is a little indulgent, uh, but I, I kind of wanted to read the whole Time Magazine piece because it's incredibly amusing. And it also captures the cultural context in which Nintendo found themselves where they felt some pressure to um, expand the Nintendo Entertainment Systems capabilities uh, to include um, things that, that were approved by parents and things. So here's the Here's the, uh, some snippets from the Time Magazine piece. Poor Nintendo. The Japanese conglomerates may have enthralled youngsters with the world's most popular home video games, but it gets no respect from adults. An anti-violence watchdog group has rated some 70% of the, games, uh, the company's games harmful for children. Physicians warned that too much rapid fire button pushing can lead to hand strain, a condition dubbed Nintendinitis. And many parents seeing their kids play Super Mario Brothers for hours on end are asking what a nonstop diet of synthetic reality is doing to impressionable young minds. This is nonstop diet of synthetic reality, I thought was a pretty great turn of phrase. Some funny excerpts here. This is not guilt money, insists Media Lab director Nicholas Negroponte. The cash will be given, apparently with no strings attached, to support the work of Pref Professor Seymour Papert, creator of the Logo Computer Language. Um, and there's another great line. For a distinguished educator to take money from the purveyor of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video game may seem like the American Cancer Society soliciting funds from a cigarette company, but Papert has always been a maverick. Um, and, uh, and there's some, some funny quotes uh, from, from some of the people involved, but there's this Papert quote uh, that uh, I really loved and I wanted to share. So Papert says, this is not from the announcement, but it's, it's, it's overlapping. Um, he's talked about Nintendo a number of times. Um, there's a, a shorter quote where he just says, I think schools do more harm than Nintendo. Anyway, here's this longer Papert quote. Game designers have a better take on the nature of learning than curriculum designers. Their livelihood depends on millions of people being prepared to undertake the serious amount of learning needed to master a complex game. If their public failed to learn, they would go out of business. In the case of curriculum designers, the situation is reversed. Their business is boosted whenever students fail to learn and st schools clamor for a new curriculum. I believe that this explains why I have learned very little about learning from reading textbooks on curriculum design and have learned a great deal from both the users, mostly kids, and the designers, often grown-up kids of computer games. Um, this is just like a fun quote. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I don't know that this like money particularly went anywhere that fed back in the development of any Nintendo games, but I like that little linkage out to some of these other um, cultural moods. And I know that uh, at least some folks in the chat are probably... Um, Media Lab aficionados. So that's a neat little little connection. Um, so anyway, a couple of years pass, um, and they release Mario Paint. Um, and so Mario Paint is sort of like their definitive answer to this concern. Um, and you can see in the positioning there, we're going to spend a lot of time on Mario Paint because Mario Paint is iconic, and it's also uh, uh, really obviously the uh, 
the most relevant predecessor to WarioWare DIY. Um, but there, you can see here on the Mario Paint advertisement that Nintendo ran, um, there's this headline, send your kids to art, music, and film school for only $60. Um, and so this was this is an ad they ran in like Good Housekeeping and um, various magazines that parents read. Um, so this is definitely their attempt to sort of like spin the Nintendo as, well, this is the Super Nintendo by now, but their attempt to spin the Super Nintendo as um, as an educational or creative expression device um, that uh, your, your kids will benefit from as opposed to um, rot their brains on. So here's Mario Paint. So Mario Paint uh, came with a mouse and mouse pad that you plugged into your Super Nintendo with a woefully short cable. Um, and you can see the main interface uh, in the top right there. Um, so Mario Paint, uh, you know, looks a lot like Kid Picks or something like that. Um, and it's uh, largely a drawing tool uh, with some coloring tools. Um, and, uh, and you'll see when, when we get into WarioWare how much the drawing tools in WarioWare are directly lifted. Um, from these drawing tools as a as the direct reference point. Um, but Mario Paint uh, was a pretty impressive program um, and it had other features beyond just uh, drawing and coloring. So uh, here's the music editor where you can see you use the, the same stamps that you have access to in the drawing tool that you can use to kind of create collages. Um, you can, in this context, they're, they're the same stamps, but instead they actually each play uh, unique sounds, um, and so you can compose music by repurposing this, the stamps from drawing uh, into this music environment. Um, and then there's also like animation functionality where you could create, um, you know, cell-based, uh, frame-based animation. Um, and you you are you are seeing some of these little uh, UI details that uh, really make WarioWare DIY special in terms of the extreme skeuomorphism, uh, in terms of like some of the wit and and uh, the surprising choices of iconography um, here. Uh, Probably one of the coolest things that I that I found when I was uh, doing research on Mario Paint was the official player's guide. So this is the official Nintendo player's guide that you could buy for Mario Paint and produced by Nintendo. Um, I suspect it wasn't necessarily produced by the team that worked on Mario Paint, but there's so much cool stuff in this in this book. And again, it connects to that uh, aspect of Nintendo's skill as they're they're sensitive to the learning experience and they're sensitive to how people are going to need to be introduced to to this material. Um, and the, the opening section is, is, is very funny. Um, it's a history. And so uh, I don't know if you can, you can read the text um, at the, on the stream, but it, the, that paragraph says, there's never been a program quite like Mario Paint. Computer paint programs may be more sophisticated, but they don't cover as much ground. Mario Paint lets you draw, animate, create music and play. And it does it in such easy ways that you can master the skills in just minutes. This wasn't always the story for artists, as you'll see in this brief look at the precursors to Mario Paint. Um, so there's this historical overview that the book then gives, uh, trying to describe the predecessors to Mario Paint. Um, and so I just wanna go from that paragraph. So the next paragraph that explains the predecessors to Mario Paint reads, in Western art, the realism of the Impressionists turned to abstract forms by the early 20th century. Although the masters of this period primarily used paints, later artists like Andy Warhol would use anything. If they had used Mario paint, we may have seen images like those below. So you can see here, let's try to get out of the way a little bit. Um, and so you can see their, their art history from 1900 to 1940. There's about four painters you need to know. Um, I also like this alternate reality they posit where Kandinsky was using Mario Paint. There are so many different things about that reality that it's it's fun to just even try to take it as a conjecture. Um, you can see on the right side, uh, there's the section, the next major development after the 1940s, when painting was done, they, we'd already figured out everything there. They move on to animation, right? That was like the next thing after painting somehow. Um, and, uh, and they show animation, which is again, another feature supported by Mario Paint. Um, Oops, I actually put this out of order. But anyway, the next section of history is the is the history of music. Um, in particular, what I like about this this one is that the four bands, so this is the history of music from 1960 to 1990. And there are four key bands you need to know. The Velvet Underground and Nico, Bruce Springsteen, John Lennon, and Guns N' Roses. That's the musical history of 1960 to 1990, as per Nintendo. And then in the 1990s, this is the era now that we have all of that predecessor technology out of the way, this is the era of Mario Paint. And in 1990 something, we're gonna have our first Mario Paint exhibit, presumably after the release of Mario Paint. And then in 2000 something, we're gonna have the Mario Paint Institute open. So they're conjecturing into this future where Mario Paint 
uh, is is uh, something that's taught in, in an institutional setting, which is uh, I just I appreciate those uh, those details. Um, so this book kind of continues to basically like introduce uh, folks to various uh, techniques and approaches and some stuff that you can just copy directly uh, out of the book um, for uh, for creating art. Um, here's a cool page for basically it's like a trick where you exploit the stamp tool to create custom brushes. So you can create like your own brush and then draw with that brush, which is, I believe, just in a, uh, an abuse of stamps and not a natively supported like brush feature. But it's really cool that they thought of this um, alternative approach. And, and Nikki, this is the slide that I, that I mentioned. It's very brushy. And they had examples of like, you know, legitimizing paintings, right? You can you can do a still life. This is real art. See, you can make a grape. Um, and that's how you know this is like this is this is substantial um, stuff, right? Um, I love this section uh, on Beethoven. So here you have like a hybrid multimedia project where they give you the guides to uh, to create his Ninth Symphony in the, the music tool, but then they also give you the drawing guides uh, to create uh, a, an animated uh, depiction of, of Beethoven performing his music. And there's this great little quote, what's that? A bead of sweat forming on Beethoven's left brow? Yes, it is. He's working very hard. This cool four frame animation works just as hard. And so you can see in like the, some of the close ups there, the dripping sweat on Beethoven's uh, brow uh, animated uh, so lovingly. It was a really uh, fantastic little, little section. So they, they teach you about music concepts right here, are a bunch of different like genre specific like drum patterns. Uh, they teach you about chords and harmony and how to distinguish between like rhythm and melody. Um, this is an amazing section teaching you how to do music videos. Uh, so this is somebody who did a music video for Sitting on the Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding. Which, like, I couldn't find a video of this. I would love to find an actual like video copy of this music video for Sitting on the Dock of the Bay because it looks fantastic um, and vaguely sort of like Garfield-ish, which is which is funny. And then they have this like MPTV, like this like parody of the MTV logo for Mario Paint, MP Mario Paint TV, and they teach you how to do your own MPTV logos. Um, I love this. So this is a section where they introduce the concept of a video letter. So a video letter, so you you know letters, right? You send letters to your friends in the mail. Well, what if you could send them a video letter instead? And so it, 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 it says, just think how impressed your friends and family will be when they receive their first video letters from you. Um, and so they teach you like how to do the AV setup so that you can transfer uh, animations in Mario Paint to a VHS so that you can ship a VHS to a friend as a letter. Um, which is a, a, a really lovely concept. I'd love to know if anybody made it. Um, there is game making. Um, they do have like a little section on game making. There's no logic editor uh, or scripting editor whatsoever in Mario Paint. So these are purely games you can play by just placing stamps and going back and forth. So like chess is kind of an obvious example where if you just move stamps around, you can sort of pretend you're, you're, you've created a game. And so it's kind of like local multiplayer stuff that, that uses this, converts the stamp system into sort of like a pseudo game environment. Um, and so they try to really did try to go multimedia again, another theme where you kind of can see art, music, sound, games, you know, the whole package um, uh, and as a kind of, uh, not just kind of games, but this whole, this whole rich ecosystem. Um, in particular, what's of note for us in Mario Paint is this section of the app, uh, which is this little coffee mug. So this was like, if you're gonna take a break, if you wanted a break from painting, you can play this little mini game where you um, swat flies. Um, and so you'd like use the mouse and you would just like click the little swatter and it would swat the flies and you get some points and it was just like a little mini game. Um, and there's a couple things about this. So one is, uh, I think it's fun that there's the idea that you like take a break from art to play a game and it's represented as a coffee cup. So this is like a break from like the rest of the app. I think it'd be awesome if more apps had like a place to go to take a break. Um, and then, and this is something that, that actually repeats itself and actually becomes uh, the sort of like, uh, this is sort of like the er warrior wear. Um, and we'll come back to how this this thread actually eventually evolves um, fully into, into warrior wear. Um, so uh, here's uh, an interesting little game, Sound Fantasy, uh, a first party Nintendo music game. So this was for, um, uh, sort of like Mario, what Mario Paint is to drawing, this is to music. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to to create music. Uh, this was abandoned and canceled, but uh, people have ROMs of the prototypes, and so you can you can check out what they're up to. What's being uh, shown there in the bottom right is that you would lay down tiles of colors, 
and then you would drop bugs. That's what's in the top left. You would like create, you would assemble bugs and then draw a map of colors and then drop the bugs on the map. And then the bugs would explore the map. And whenever they would path, pass over a box, they would make a noise. And the noise would depend on the color and the specific bug type. Um, and that would produce a unique noise. So you could compose music by laying out a drawing and then having bugs walk over them, bugs that you designed. Um, this was one of four music making mini games in sound fantasy. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, this was canceled without much explanation, um, but the creator went on to do Sim Tunes um, and Electroplankton, uh, which was sort of, sort of some cult, um, some cult games. So uh, this, this work wasn't lost forever. Um, 1998, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, we have the Game Boy Camera. Um, so this was a peripheral that you could buy for the Game Boy um, and the Game Boy Color um, and use it to take photos. Um, here's some examples of the photos you could take with the Game Boy Camera. This is sort of like how photos um, uh, looked by default. And it actually has like a pretty, a pretty stark and, and, and interesting and cool aesthetic. Um, I think it holds up pretty well. Um, that's uh, Jupiter um, being, that's a, the, all the way to the right there is a picture of Jupiter being uh, photographed with the Game Boy Camera. I believe a, 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 perhaps a heavily modified Game Boy camera, um, but still pretty cool um, to see it. Um, the Game Boy camera came with the Game Boy printer. Uh, and so again, it's sort of this connection to like, okay, like how is uh, this content isn't just trapped in, a, in a, this little walled garden. And this, there's, this is something that you create and can share and distribute. And it's like, you know, it's, it's real or it's legitimized in that, in that way. Um, and so you could, uh, you could buy this printer peripheral, connect it to your Game Boy, and then print out your photos onto um, thermal, uh, thermal printer tape um, and, uh, and share them with your friends. And actually, uh, I think the camera was the main reason for the printer, but the printer actually connects to a bunch of other games like Pokemon Yellow is compatible with the camera, or sorry, with the printer. And so with Pokemon Yellow, you can print out like, you know, uh, snippets from the Pokedex and stuff like that for different Pokemon. Um, so uh, the Game Boy cameras and the printer is, is, a, is a super cool combo peripheral. Um, a few things about the Game Boy camera that I think are, again, you see these like repeat themes. Uh, you have the ability to like doodle and draw and use stickers and stamps and like decorate and stuff like that. So again, you get this sort of like multimedia um, thing. Um, this is the coolest thing that, uh, that I found when, when looking at the Game Boy camera because I didn't, uh, I never had a Game Boy camera, um, but if you look at the manual, they have this feature called hotspots. And so a hotspot is a little, you can, there's like five of them. There's little circles you can drag and put on your photo. And then if somebody else tapped or not tapped, but, you know, because it's not a tappable thing, but in a, use the Game Boy to select one of those, you could then link to other photos. Um, so what you could do is create photos that had special areas where if you interacted with them, could send you to another photo. So you could have a door. And when you interact with the door, it takes you to like a photo of like what's beyond the door. And so it was actually sort of like a micro twine type authoring environment that was like you could use the Game Boy camera to create interactive, you know, visual narratives um, that had like branching paths and stuff like that. It's uh, it's so cool. Um, and you know, it sounds, animations, and stickers and stuff like that um, all all baked into the Game Boy camera. Um, and uh, and yeah, um, it's a, a pretty pretty amazing little little thing. Glad we have some some Game Boy Camera fans out there. I always wanted one because um, it seems so cool uh, for my Game Boy Color, but never had one. Um, so let's see. Um, so 1998. This is one of the maybe even lesser known known ones on this this list. Mario No Fotopi. Um, so this was a special N64 cartridge that accepted SD cards. Uh, and you would like slot your SD cards in there. Uh, again, this is a Japan only release. Um, and you can see some of the previews up in the top right where you could basically then decorate your photos. So this was like Mario Paint meets like a photo editor as a kind of combined authoring tool. Um, and, uh, and you would use this little special funky cartridge. And I like that. There's a few funky cartridges we're gonna look at, which I like seeing. Um, this is like a little snippet from Mario No Fotopi. I thought I watched a video of people people drawing with it. And there are actually a bunch of like really neat things going on in the UI and a bunch of UI things. And I think even sounds that eventually made their way into WarioWare. Um, so again, you see, this is a kind of an iteration on the Mario Paint UI. And we'll see a few more before we even get to, to WarioWare. Um, this is one specific screen that I thought was so cool and worth calling out. So that's 
This is the color picker. So the color picker gives you three Yoshis, a red Yoshi, a green Yoshi, and a blue Yoshi. And you drag a piece of fruit around and Yoshi's tongue extends to catch the fruit. And that's the RGB sliders that then determine the color you're working with. So I liked the Yoshi based color picker um, as this kind of like little one-off detail inside of Mario No Fotopi. Um, so this really blew me away because I was totally not aware whatsoever of this line of games. So this was the Mario Artist series. So this is Mario Artist Paint Studio. Um, and this is, uh, you can probably immediately tell, this is, again, an iteration on the Mario Paint uh, format. Um, this is for the, uh, the Nintendo 64 era. Um, and uh, it imported pictures from the Game Boy camera. So they had that, that cool uh, integration. Um, and you can see it's sort of like, uh, there's like, you know, more 3D style like stamps, but it's still just like stamps and coloring and things like that. Um, so this is Mario Artist Paint Studio. This is 1999. Um, this is also amazing. So the Mario Artist was a series. So this is Mario Artist Talent Studio. So Talent Studio came with this transfer pack, again, a cool novelty cartridge where you can see that like cartridge that had um, video uh, ports. So the idea behind Mario Artist Talent Studio is that you would hook up a camcorder or other kind of video source to the Nintendo through this cartridge. And then it would take your face and put it on a 3D figure, which you could then customize with like clothing and the body type and hair and all that kind of stuff. And then you could use those avatars in uh, various sort of like videos. And so you could like, like, okay, I'm gonna have my little avatar do like a dance or whatever. And then that would produce a little video that you could then um, uh, share or whatever. Um, and so this is clearly the predecessor to the to the Mii system uh, that is uh, still in use today, Nintendo's stuff. Um, and it took a few hops to get from here into the Mii uh, uh, system, but uh, this is very obviously the, the predecessor to the Mii system, um, which I didn't know existed. Um, even more shockingly, uh, there's Mario Artist Polygon Studio. Um, so Mario Artist Polygon Studio was a 3D editor. Um, that uh, you, I guess, manipulated with a Nintendo 64 controller and you could build 3D models. Um, and uh, further, those 3D models could contain uh, various like interactive systems. So here they're putting, a, in the top left, they're putting a power engine um, into the helicopter. And then there's like a game environment where the 3D models can then kind of, you can use them, you can fly them around. And uh, uh, so presumably there's some sort of simplistic physics system. Um, and uh, and so you could take your 3D models and, and bring them out into the world, which is extremely reminiscent of the um, the cardboard Labo kits, which they uh, have now for the Switch, which is another fantastic thing, which I'm not gonna talk, in, talk about in this talk, but um, maybe sometime. Uh, there's this random little screen here uh, from this game environment with this quote. I have no idea what the context is, but I just loved it. It's the quote says, for 50 years, we have been placing these toasters in this world we bake the bread you can trust. I don't know what that means. Maybe you had to go collect pieces of toast in this game or something like that. Um, more incredibly still uh, was Mario Artist Communication Kit. So Mario Artist Communication Kit let you connect to the internet where you could then swap uh, assets created in the other Mario Artist games and you could upload them and download them from other people. You could also even order your uh, creations in the Polygon uh, tool as paper cutouts. So you could like send your th your Polygon uh, to some service that would then manufacture a, cu a paper cutout and send it to you so that you could assemble your model in real life. Again, a kind of predecessor to, to the Labo stuff um, they eventually did and just kind of a, a miraculous that this existed at all. Um, so if you're surprised uh, about this stuff as, as I was, um, one thing that might clarify why you never heard about this stuff is that these were uh, games for the 64DD, uh, which was a uh, heavily delayed, failed uh, peripheral for the Nintendo 64 um, that basically sat underneath it. You can see how beefy your N64 got when you sat it on top of the 64DD, um, which then let it take like... Uh, uh, a different type of disc and also expanded a bunch of the the, the capabilities of the n64 um, and so you would also use this modem cartridge so on the right there is a, a nintendo 64 cartridge that was a modem um, that you would use there's a service called randnet and you would get a starter kit that would come with all this stuff and you would connect your nintendo 64 to the internet um, and then you could use a uh, uh, mario artist communication kit to then upload and download um, creations in, in mario artist 
Um, and uh, and the, the 64 DD was a failure. Um, these games uh, never made it out of Japan. It does have a cool box. The 64 DD has an incredible box. The Mario Artist uh, games have incredible boxes, um, but not, not a huge hit. And uh, they scrapped the remaining uh, Mario Artist games. So there's actually going to be four more Mario Artist games um, in the series that, that never came to pass. Um, graphical Message Maker, Sound Maker, Video Jockey Maker, and importantly, Game Maker. So there was a Game Maker that they had planned for Mario Artist um, that uh, never saw the light of day. And uh, that's a real a real tragedy because I would, I would love to know what, what they were cooking up at this, this era. The Mario Artist series is particularly important for the WarioWare franchise because if we go back to, to Polygon Studio, this is from Polygon Studio, they had a little section where you could take a break from uh, the core authoring environment and play mini games. And so this was a mode called Sound Bomber. Um, and you would basically play a series of mini games that would come at you super fast and you had to do them super quick. Um, and, uh, and this was sort of like the secondary mode uh, separate from, from the, the, the 3D editor. Um, so again, this is sort of, this mirrors the um, fly swatting game from Mario Paint as a sort of like, okay, you know, Nintendo normally makes games, and so we're going to throw you a little kind of like mini game inside of this creative tool so that I guess the gamers can have something to do. Um, and uh, and so here's where they, they pioneer the format of uh, playing a long string of very small games, uh, which is uh, quite clearly um, the immediate predecessor for, for WarioWare. So um, this is 2003. They released the first WarioWare game, WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games, uh, Micro Games with a dollar sign. Um, and uh, this was just like them taking that mode and, and blowing it out into a real game. And you can even see down in the bottom right, there's like there's that, that black and white speaker image in the top right here. You see in the bottom right there. Um, so the that Polygon 3D editor app, even though it didn't make a huge splash in the market, um, did have this mode, which eventually then was spun out and became uh, WarioWare Inc. Um, and so WarioWare Inc. was the first, uh, first WarioWare game. Um, and yeah, it's, it presented a series of, of very short games that you had to play in rapid succession. Um, I loved it. Uh, I totally fell in love with this game um, right away and uh, and was was deeply obsessed with the the charming humor. Um, and uh, interestingly, the uh, the director of Mario Paint was the director of WarioWare. So it's this, a lot of the same people, uh, not just him, but many of the people who worked on Mario Paint went on to work on all these tools, Mario Artists and everything up to that. Um, and uh, all the way through into uh, going on to create the WarioWare series. And so they made a few more WarioWare games before they finally got to WarioWare DIY, um, which is the one that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and uh, I wanted to share some of the kind of uh, context around WarioWare DIY, um, the creation of it and some of their experiences creating it. Um, so these are some of the folks, this is from like an Iwata Asks uh, interview that uh, the Nintendo released of all about WarioWare DIY. I'm um, talking about the creation of it and the development of it. Um, and so these are different members of the team that I'm going to be like reading reading excerpts from. Um, so that's Iwata on the right. Iwata was the president of Nintendo at the time. Um, and uh, so he conducted the interviews of the, the folks who worked on the games. Um, so, okay. Uh, let's see. So I wanted to read some excerpts from this interview because there's some some really lovely, lovely details that, that, that play into the themes that I mentioned before. Okay, so... Um, so one thing that they noted was that when they were making the first WarioWare game, the part of the development process where they made the little micro games was by far the funnest part. There's a little quote where they talk about how it didn't even feel like work. Like they would look forward to making these little games. They'd look forward to sharing these games with the other people who were working on the, the game. And it wasn't like making the other parts of the, of the software. It wasn't like the kind of like uh, uh, programming tasks that would eat up a ton of hours and was felt like work. Like, the creation of the micro games didn't feel like work is one thing they said. And they really just like, that was a big emotional experience that they all had it was like, wow, this part is like super satisfying. Um, and so there's a, here's a quote from Goro Abe, who is the director of WarioWare DIY. Um, and he says, uh, a while back, there was some software that came out for making RPGs and shooting games. I remember it was fun when I tried it, but I don't think I ever completed anything. It takes quite a long time to complete one game. And somewhere along the way, I would quit. I used to write my own manga. I would always give up partway through a long story, but I could do a short comic strip. And so part of what Abe is, is reflecting on is the fact that like other game making tools that he's, worked, he's used in the past, he would just give up before he would finish. Um, and there was something about the creation environment that kind of he felt led to that. 
And that was one of the inputs that went into designing WarriorWare DIY. And um, uh, Hataki, Hatakayama, um, the, another one of the, the folks who worked on it, he has another quote here as well. He says, um, he kind of reflects a similar experience. He's like, yeah, I would make about one third of a stage and then I would quit. It takes a lot of work to finish a game. Making multiple stages for a game was unthinkable, so I would just quit. Um, he was like, when I was a kid, I was absorbed in Mario Paint when I was in elementary school. I wasn't the type to draw pictures, but for some reason I drew a lot with Mario Paint. I was doing it on the television my parents would watch. At the time, I was always playing video games. And when I played games like RPGs, they would make disapproving facial expressions. But when I drew with Mario Paint, they would say, wow, it's really good. And so both of these uh, these guys are talking about how like they wouldn't they would never finish stuff uh, in the past, and they would have a hard time feeling motivated to get to the to the end. Um, and that was a big shared experience they had with with game creation that they wanted to to be at a big influence on the design of WarioWare DIY, which I think is super cool to have that that awareness. Um, and so when they were working on the WarioWare game for Wii, and they were thinking about all the different uh, possibilities with the hardware they realized that it would be possible for um, the fact that the stylus and the DS and the Wiimote were actually synonymous inputs. And so that it was possible to create a WarioWare game that would work on both systems. And that was sort of the genesis for thinking through WarioWare is the idea that you could make games in the DS and then play them on the Wii. Um, and so they, they made a prototype um, and they handed the prototype of WarioWare DIY to uh, one of the game designers um, who works at Nintendo. And uh, they made a micro game in a few hours. And that was what convinced them that it would work, that a, that a designer who was not a programmer uh, made a really fun game in the authoring tool. Um, and there's this quote from Sugioka, I think more of one of the producers. He says, the team was excited. A designer had made it. So we were amazed. We could understand if it had been a programmer. He, he would know special techniques and be good at thinking things through logically. We were impressed that even a designer could create such a decent game. And so this is like a big wake up moment for them that a, that a lowly figure like a designer could make something good without being a programmer it really blew some minds. Um, so shout out to the to the designers at Nintendo. Um, so Iwata goes on to ask about uh, the experience of debugging this game, because unlike any other games, there's like so many possibilities. There's sort of no good way to debug uh, the, the game in a, in a complete way. Um, and so Goro Abe is talking about the, the experience of debugging things. And he says, yeah, it was difficult. Uh, the debuggers were making all kinds of games. Creating micro games was part of their work as debuggers, but they went above and beyond the call of duty, mastering all sorts of advanced techniques. And Iwata says, they got to where they could make some incredible stuff. They were making our developers think that they'd been outdone. And Abe remarks, not a single debugger was a programmer though. Some of the actual micro games made by the debugging team are actually in WarioWare DIY, and their names appear in the staff credits. And Iwata notes, that's amazing. Nothing like that has ever happened before. So that's really cool that in Nintendo's history, this is a case where the QA team ended up uh, shipping uh, some products uh, in a Nintendo game. Um, Sugioka mentions uh, that earlier folks were talking about how uh, they used to be in, into Mario Paint, and he asked a bunch of the staff members on WarioWare DIY about Mario Paint. Um, and a bunch of the staff members all agreed that Mario Paint was the game that taught them the joy of like, creation when they were kids, um, especially people like in their in their the in their twenties, like my age, twenties well, back when this game was made. Um, and uh, and I want to ask, oh, did Mario Paint make you who you are today? And Hatakiyama says, without a doubt, I remember that time very clearly. Um, and uh, and they note before Mario Paint, there was Family Basic. And the staff member in charge of sound uh, uh, for WarioWare DIY, uh, he learned uh, to love making music in Family Basic. And so he actually put a bunch of the sound, the music from Family Basic into WarioWare DIY. So again, that continuity, right? The team who worked on this, they all grew up on Mario Paint and that's what got them all into the fall in love with uh, this kind of creation stuff. And then they kind of brought all of that from their childhood into this, uh, which I think is, is such a cool, Thing. And again, speaks to that continuity um, of uh, those ideas from, from game to game. Um, yeah, a couple more quotes. Uh, so uh, Abe is talking about how he received a, uh, a, a WarioWare micro game for, he got a birthday card in the form of a, of a micro game. And he says, I was moved. I think it could be fun to create a micro game for a certain person like that. Or there's like a cup of tea sitting in front of you. So you make a game about drinking tea. Or you could use your own experiences for something like a diary. If you try turning that into a game, you'll be able to make all kinds of stuff. 
And then you can unabashedly have lots of people try what you've made. So just making a game about drinking a cup of tea, I think is just such a beautiful idea and, and very resonant with the stuff that I think makes us excited about working on something like Castle. Um, and then Iwata closes. Uh, it seems your lives began making uh, games with Family Basic or Mario Paint or some other kind of software. But I began making video games with a programmable calculator. It could only display numbers, but I worked hard to finally get one, used it to make games, and enjoyed playing them together with my friends in high school. As someone with that kind of experience, I'm very jealous of people today. I mean, something like WarioWare DIY will be on the shelves and people will be able to make as much as they want. Of course, even if you don't make any games, you can enjoy it. But I myself feel quite strongly that the joy of making games is deeper than the joy of playing them. So I hope WarioWare DIY will increase the people who awaken to that, even if only by one person. Um, and so what I love about a lot of these passages, uh, besides the fact that a lot of them are heavily influenced by Mario Paint and that you kind of see that direct lineage, um, I think is also just that a lot of what their goals were when they were creating this game were about sharing their own passion and like translating their own passion for creating games in an environment where players could experience that. And so that transfer of passion into the software, I think is a really uh, beautiful uh, and touching thing that they all seem to have in common with each other. And it's definitely something that I think uh, those of us on the Castle team um, resonate with as well. Um, that that's a lot of what we're also trying to do. Um, so WarioWare DIY uh, obviously was released and the, the second half of this talk is gonna spend a lot of time uh, pouring over the details and the decisions that make that game is, uh, so special. Um, I do, I'm not going to do that now, but I did want to kind of uh, quickly jump further past that. So um, the next piece after WarioWare DIY that would be obviously in this lineage would be Super Mario Maker um, and Super Mario Maker 2, uh, which were released for the, the Wii U and uh, uh, the Switch. Um, and uh, interestingly, Mario Maker began as a Mario Paint sequel. So when they were working on the Wii U, they realized the stylus would let them uh, bring back Mario Paint. And then as they were working on Mario Paint for Wii U, uh, it uh, morphed into uh, Mario Maker with enough iteration. Um, and so this is still very much the genesis. And if you play Mario Maker, it's littered with a ton of different um, uh, shout outs to uh, Mario Paint. So Mario Paint's life uh, lives on, although albeit in a fully fledged Mario Maker environment and not in a, um, uh, not so much as, a, as an artistic tool uh, like it was back in the day. Um, so I'm not going to go as deep into these games, although there's a lot of the richness there because mostly I wanted to set the stage for the context for WarioWare. Um, and then another little piece that I got asked about last time for some context around WarioWare that I wanted to cover is um, where the scene is now. Because in 2014, Nintendo shut down all of their um, online services and um, uh, for the Wii and for the for the DS, which effectively like uh, nuked the stuff that people had created for the um, uh, at the time. And it would be po impossible to share or download new stuff. Um, and so uh, fortunately, there are preservation movements, and so I just wanted to shout them out. Um, so one is the ReConnect24, um, which brings back WeConnect24, uh, which is important for transferring this stuff. And the other one is Dujan Soft Store, uh, which has a bunch of, you can see right there, those are all WarioWare uh, games that people have made. So they got a big dump of the stuff that has been created, and, and they're archiving it. So um, special shout outs to the, to the preservation uh, movements that are going on there. Um, so cool. So that was the that was the the history that I wanted to give of WarioWare DIY um, to kind of show off a bunch of those um, that context because WarioWare DIY does in in effect um, build on, on on many 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 years and many 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 different trials um, that Nintendo went through to to create these kinds of things. So um, I I knew about Mario Paint for sure, um, and I had a vague idea of some of those other things, and I, I knew about Game Boy Camera, but I uh, hadn't used one myself, but uh, that full suite of history was like actually not something I, I really knew until I started prepping for this talk. And um, there are so many uh, fascinating uh, uh, you know, steps along the way that, that uh, normally you don't get to see. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, getting to see as much of that little history as I enjoyed um, digging through it because it's a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so cool. So um, part two of this talk where we're gonna really do a deep dive into uh, WarioWare DOI specifically. Um, I haven't scheduled yet, uh, so uh, look out for that. Um, it might be part of the Castle Spring Party if I have time to to get it in. Uh, it might just be a totally separate event, um, but uh, I will certainly will certainly tweet about it. It'll be on our Discord and everything like that. And um, uh, once again, I, I do hope you you join us for the for the Spring Party and, and you make some stuff and, and you you get to check out Castle and um, and hopefully if you do uh, check it out, you get to see um, some of the same uh, some of the same ideas and some of the same passion for. For sharing the the beauty of um, you know computational uh, expressivity um, that 
uh, that many of these games reflect and that, that we're certainly starting to reflect as well. Uh, cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.